thank you for joining us for Reclaiming the Lost Souls, a limited podcast series brought to you by the Lost Souls Public Memorial Project and the East Brunswick Public Library. I am your host, Melissa Hozik. In this episode, we will learn more about the dark time in our local history, where free Black persons were forced into slavery and shipped from New Jersey to the Deep South. We'll also learn how we can help reclaim their names and tell their stories. I am joined by Tony and Jim Armstead, who are members of the Lost Souls Public Memorial Project. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Yes, indeed. What is the purpose of the Lost Souls Public Memorial Project, and how did you learn about it? Well, the Memorial Project is primarily to make sure that about 137 people who were removed from this area and sold into slavery in the South are remembered. We make sure that their names are spoken at least once a year. And the other part is to make sure that people remember that such a deed was undertaken. The recitation of names is very powerful. If you can imagine, sort of related to what goes on in New York City on 9-11 each year to commemorate those who were lost in 2001. Just speaking the names and putting that memory out there for people, there's a feeling attached to it. And making sure that these people are not forgotten is what the bottom line of our project is. What we learned about this particular set of nefarious deeds of sending people into slavery in 1818 was that it was done within legal rights by two judges who decided in Middlesex County that this was a financially lucrative endeavor for them. And as a result, people who were freed and some were enslaved persons here in New Jersey, as I said, this was 1818, and people were convinced that by getting on a ship and going south, they could get a contract and make money that they weren't able to make as the North was becoming more industrialized and less agrarian. People who had been used to working with the cotton fields and sugarcane and tobacco fields in the South, some of whom had come North to seek industrial jobs, were anxious to earn money that they didn't find when they got to the North. And some were convinced that they could use their skills and get this money by going back south, and others were simply hijacked into following their children, who these judges said had agreed to leave New Jersey, not necessarily knowing where they were headed, but they had to agree to leave New Jersey. The way that we learned about the project was a presentation that was given at one of our chapter meetings that identified the acts of this nefarious group. And my wife and I and several members of our chapter of the African American Historical and Genealogical Society were interested, attended the first recitation, and we were hooked. I was born and raised in New Jersey, and I've never heard this story before. Were there laws in place to prevent forced slavery? In 1808, the Congress of the United States outlawed international slave trade, so they were not receiving any more slaves from overseas officially. There were efforts being moved to ensure that those people who were enslaved had a gradual manumission process. So if they were born in a given year, some when they turned 21, that was usually the females, and 25 when they were males, would obtain their freedom which basically meant that anybody who owned slaves at a point in time, that that asset would no longer be available. And with the ability to get slaves being reduced, the folks in New Jersey had a need to find a way to take advantage of their current assets. And in part, that occurred in 1812 when the Jersey General Assembly pass a law saying anyone going back into slavery on a permanent basis and being removed from the state had to appear before two judges of the common court and state their agreement to be enslaved. Were there individuals who held places of power in New Jersey who were responsible for the creation of this slave ring? One of the people that appeared to have organized this, this band of kidnappers was a judge in Middlesex County which gave him the ability, number one, to organize this whole process of trade and 
also to sit and make sure that it occurred as it was desired because he was one of the judges of the Court of Common Pleas who would sit down and hear these people's admissions to return to slavery. In some cases, children as young as two months old were deemed to have agreed to go south just because when they were asked by the judge or in the court, they cried. And that was stipulated as their agreement to be removed from the state. And their parents, in some cases, were told that, well, your child has agreed to be moved from the state. So we're going to do that. And if you want to stay with them, you need to agree as well. And that was the only way they were allowed to stay with their children. And I don't think the age of consent was lower than 10. So they were sort of hogtied into the process. Why did Judge Van Wickle allow this to happen? Well, one of the things that was occurring because the North was becoming more industrialized and agrarian, there were excess enslaved people. And if you're in the North and you had a slave and you went to sell that person, you get a price for them. But because there is much more demand in the South, if you could sell somebody up here for $50, you might be able to sell them down in the South for $250. Those are not accurate numbers, but it's just giving an idea of the impact the man had. And also, one of Judge Van Wickle's in-laws had a plantation in the South that needed people and came north with a bunch of money to populate this plantation. So it was mostly driven by money. That is not a story I had heard until I began working here in East Brunswick. And that's, that's a hard story to tell. Could you tell us more about how the Lost Souls Memorial Project was founded? Well, the Lost Souls Memorial Project was originally formed as a committee of parties interested in exploring the possibility of removing Judge Jacob Van Wickle's name from a street because his name enjoys prominence around East Brunswick. And several people within the community, having heard this story of the slave ring, were appalled and went to the township to ask that this street that was named for Van Wickle have his name removed and be replaced with someone else's name. And the township did not vote on that, but eventually the community persons were encouraged to join hands around making a memorial to the people who were lost, as opposed to focusing on the judge, because he wasn't the only judge, although he had more attention drawn to him. So ultimately, the effort is to amplify these marginalized voices to make sure that their names, as we said before, are spoken and that they don't become forgotten. And some of the organizations that got involved were the local NAACP, the Congregation of the Unitarian Society of East Brunswick, along with members of other faith congregations, some historians from Rutgers University, including Dr. Peter Kahn, who's in the, he's in the science department, who is a long-term resident of East Brunswick. And he helped gather names on the petition to get the name of the street changed. And when that looked like it was not going to happen, it was his suggestion that we establish a memorial. And in the long run, the Council for the Humanities and the local politicians in East Brunswick were very supportive and helped develop the idea that this memorial could be right outside of the East Brunswick Community Arts Center. So there is now a plaque where that memorial will go. And we're in the process of finding out what that memorial will look like, but we do have a place to put it. What other organizations are helping support and promote the project so it reaches a wider audience? Well, as you're aware, we do have the support of the East Brunswick Public Library. Thank you. And uh, you're welcome. <laughs> and New Jersey Council for the Humanities has been very helpful, giving us a grant early on. And as I said, the Unitarian Society and um, AAHGS. African-American Historical and Genealogical Society. And we are trying to see if we can, once we have this memorial established, if we can get it put on the state list. They're going to establish a trail throughout New Jersey of memorials that one can visit. And we're trying to make sure that Lost Souls gets to be on that list. I know that you have a lot of young student activists who have become part of the project and they did a lake walk. They also helped you with the display, and I believe there was an essay project? 
Right, right. We had several high schoolers became involved. The East Brunswick Youth Council is working with the arts department to help us get the word out. And they've made such unbelievable posters that are going to be displayed within the library for the month of February to help commemorate Black History Month. And we have several youth who speak very eloquently about the history of Van Wickle slave ring and can tell it just as well as any of the adults in our committee can. That's important, keeping these names and bringing them back to life where they belong back in our community is a very important part of this history. You had mentioned that it was something that you had not heard about in your education or any place else. And we're finding that there's a lot of history that was not taught incorrectly. It just wasn't mentioned. And Van Wickle has popped up several times in newspaper articles or various books, but it's like someone shouting in the wind. It was identified and then it was just gone. And we're hoping that with the memorial, it will be shouted and stay there. And we do have a faction of our committee that's working on developing a curriculum. Right now, we're concentrating on middle and high school level children. Our educational guru, Crystal Langford, is working on getting a curriculum that will be tried, I'll say, in the high schools, hopefully by the spring. And so that we can make sure that the students coming up behind us do hear about this part of our history. One of the things that Dr. Peter Kahn is very adamant about is making sure that the United States kind of join in making the relevance of our real history evident and available to our youth, as opposed to what we've done in the past which is picking and choosing what we want to have remembered and what we don't want to have remembered. I believe that Stoll Langford will be talking more to us about the project and the educational component. Yes, that's correct. And she will give a, a more clear picture of what the people were doing, who these people were, who were these lost souls? How did they get involved? How did they get kidnapped or duped into getting on these ships? What was it like? What was life like in New Jersey at that time? What was life like on those ships? And what happened when they got off in Louisiana and Mississippi or wherever they got off? If people are really moved, and I hope they are by this episode, how can they get involved with the project? Well, we are hoping that people can offer their time and talents as well as their treasures, their funds to help us when possible. Currently, the most important thing is to get the word out. Listeners may want to check out the displays at the library throughout the month of February. We're commemorating Black History Month and highlighting the Lost Souls Memorial Project, including those wonderful posters developed by the students. Of course, our fundraising campaign is ongoing. And on our website, people can check a box and donate if they like, or just Check the website to see what upcoming events are happening, including in May, we will be having our fifth annual recitation of the names and the details are still being worked out. We just know that it's going to be in May and we're raising funds for the memorial itself. For more information and to get facts about how to help, listeners can go to the website. It's lostsoulsmemorialnj.com. Dot org And what they can find is the history of how we got started. All of our events will be posted there. We participated, for example, in East Brunswick Day. And then we had the youth show their posters around the lake at the library. And the East Brunswick Library occasionally has programs that allow us to participate in getting the word out to the community. And there's also a spot on there where you can ask questions or make comments to the board. And if you have an interest, ask us a question. We try to make sure that if anyone has a concern or question that we can answer it and reach out for people individually. We also have a button there if anyone is interested or knows of someone who creates memorials or if you have an idea for what you'd like to see in the way of the memorial, we do have a button there that encourages information of that sort. Tony and Jean, thank you for helping us shine light on this story to recover these lost souls. And I look forward to the next episode. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. 